first thing I just want to ask you is why did you choose the Ruby Jeans for us to meet here? Well, I'm trying to make sure I'm making better choices this year and having my nice green smoothie uh, is a good choice and I just like the environment here. And it's a fresh space, it reminds us of opportunity. It's all the good energy in this space and um, it's one of my favorite hangouts. What made you want to decide, or what made you decide to run for mayor? You know, I have been a strong advocate on a few key issues. Um, as a prosecutor in Jackson County, I work with neighborhood groups to address violent crime, uh, working proactively with neighborhood leaders, and it became very apparent that the real issue wasn't really crime, it was lack of opportunity, it was blight, um, it was substance abuse, it was mental health challenges uh, and a sense of hopelessness in a lot of these communities. And there really wasn't a whole lot I could do about any of those things as a prosecutor. Um, but I did begin to work with a lot of community partners to begin to try to bring in resources to provide opportunities to bring substance abuse treatment services. Um, you know, the mental health piece is a challenge because there's such a broad spectrum as it relates to that. So much undiagnosed trauma, um, stress, anxiety and so many people who are self-medicating with those conditions. Uh, and so as I began to meet with other community stakeholders that are supposed to be working in that space, it became apparent nobody really owned those issues. And um, someone suggested I reach out to the council person at that time uh, for support, uh, and they weren't responsive. And I then realized how that role could be a lot better utilized as a convener providing resources and um, so I ran for city council and in my time as city council I'm still committed to those same issues and I realized as a council person it's really hard for me to direct dollars I'm, I'm, I'm a convener but to direct dollars at the level and scale that need to address these concerns uh, aren't there because the budget's already spent and so after the three light vote with Cordish um, it just really really made me realize either I was going to step out and lead on the issues that matter to voters and residents, uh, or I was going to continue to be frustrated looking at my neighborhood's decline and deteriorate, and people, um, you know, just continue to be left out. And so I decided to uh, step out and run, and I've been running ever since. Uh, so June 5th, I announced and uh, have gained a lot of support from people who are clear on what my vision is about growing Kansas City together. Speaking of you know, the three light vote, one thing I wanted to talk to you about was incentives. So kind of explain to me where that frustration came for you from when um, the three light vote came up. I will tell you, um, it was a, a, a scenario where it was brought to the council that we had an obligation to um, subsidize some additional luxury apartments and garages. So it wasn't so much just the TIF, the tax abatement, it was also that the city would guarantee the debt on it as well. Uh, and that agreement, and this was like the 13th Amendment on it uh, to the original agreement, and the terms were not favorable to the city. And so I viewed that as an opportunity for us to renegotiate that agreement um, because we were already paying debt servicing on Power & Light, Casey Live, over about $13 million a year. Uh, we were paying debt servicing on one of the garages that they were utilizing for one light, they were currently building two light, and the plan was for three light and an infinite number of lights that the city would have to subsidize. And I'm like, this is not good for the taxpayers. It, the, the current market does not justify us entering into an agreement of this nature. And so after talking with the law department city manager, we learned we did not have that obligation. And we did have an opportunity to go back and renegotiate it to more favorable terms. However, the man, city manager and the mayor were not supportive of the city taking a better approach at, at protecting taxpayer dollars. And so that was very disappointing. So not only did we not have an obligation to go forward in the manner in which they had proposed, we didn't use that opportunity to put the city in a better position. So the outcome of it was it passed. Um, myself, Councilman Shields, and Councilman Fowler were the no votes on it. Um, but we obligate the city's general fund dollars up to an additional $80 million to subsidize additional luxury apartments for Cordish. Uh, and parking garages and so um, as we talk about competing issues providing resources for neighborhoods affordable housing we need 75 million dollars we just guaranteed cordage up to 80 million dollars 
you can't say one thing and then your voting record shows you support something different because it's all coming out of the same pot. And so if you gave them that money, where's the other money going to come from? If you're elected mayor, what is your vision for incentives moving forward? How do you think they should be used? They should be used how they were designed to uh, encourage and be catalysts for development in areas where there's challenges of, of uh, attracting development. And so currently in our current market, that is not how they're being utilized. Uh, it's piggybacking on one development after another. For example, I'll use Cordish again. Uh, we're substituting, substitu subsidizing, I'm sorry, three light because of performance say because of one light and two light, three light's not gonna need some help. Well, that's not how it was supposed to work, right? And I think that even when we talk about who's impacted with the incentives, the taxing jurisdictions, the school district, who is in critical need, um, the Jackson County Mental Health Fund, money's being diverted from them, the community college. So when we talk about skills training programs, we talk about good schools, we talk about supporting mental health, it's not in, uh, in isolation because these incentives are, direct, are redirecting dollars away from all those important needs every time they're voted for in the city. And so I think we need to be very clear on how we're going to use them, making sure that um, if we are going to do it, there is a community benefit or community impact where it's addressing critical need, housing, um, jobs that pay a living wage for people in the community, that, uh, for the families in the school districts that are going to be impacted by it. Um, that there's a payment in lieu of taxes either to the school district or to the mental health fund or into a jobs training program with the community colleges since they're not going to get the tax revenue. And we just have not been intentional about those approaches, uh, and, and we've got to change that. You brought up affordable housing, which has become really a hot topic in the past year or so mm -hmm. in Kansas City. How do you think the city should be tackling that issue? We need to be intentional about how we're going to do it. Again, number one is protecting existing housing stock. Uh, with minor home repair and investing those dollars. Number two is making sure that we are protecting general fund dollars and not using it to leverage or support speculative luxury real estate development, which is what we've done during this council term. Uh, and, and again, um, it's just been very frustrating to watch it happen because we knew that there was a need of 5,000 units of affordable housing and there was not uh, a collective effort for us to be able to get there but there was a political will to push forward to provide luxury housing. And so the trade-off was, well, we got a handful of affordable units, but $1,000 for a one-bedroom doesn't help the working mom with three kids who has a kid in Kansas City Public Schools or Hickam Mill School District uh, where they're struggling. And so we need to be really clear on what we're doing and who's impacted by it. So do you think the definition of what's affordable for who needs to be clearer? We've, we've stepped towards that, but the Mid-America Mid Regional Council has already defined that. Um, the gap for affordable housing is a three-bedroom home between six and $800 a month. So it's clearly defined where the need is. Um, so that's never been an issue. The question is the developers want to come in and say, well, it's affordable by some other standard according to 80% or 100% of AMI, but the average Kansas City resident is not at the average, they're below average. They're, most of them are below $40,000 a year, and um, so affordable is different. So that six to 800 range is where, the, where we need to look at. And circling back now to one of the biggest issues affecting the community, which is crime. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you mentioned this kind of at the beginning, but how your time as an assistant prosecuting attorney, kind of the experience it gave you and how it's kind of changed the way you think about crime in Kansas City. Well, it's important that we approach crime holistically. And so people will use the term being smart on crime. Um, and then we're becoming more aware of the impact of mass incarceration. Um, it's important that we look at it from a holistic approach because in my time as a prosecutor, I dealt with people. And each case represented an individual, a family, a victim's family, uh, and it gave me an up close and personal experience of dealing with crime in the community. It wasn't, it wasn't just reading the headline or the obituary, it was dealing with the individuals that either had been a victim of crime or had lost a loved one to homicide and were left to grieve. Um, and so it, it, it gave a personalized and humani humanized crime to me in the community. And so uh, my approach it is dealing with the individuals. And so we want to reduce crime. We want to engage people in a manner that we reduce their likelihood to engage in criminal activity. We want to reduce the likelihood of them being a victim of violent crime. And the way you do that is by um, creating other opportunities. Um, sometimes people are predisposed because of, you know, just the family they were born into socioeconomic status, sometimes it's the zip code, 
And sometimes there are other challenges, such as mental health challenges, um, that uh, lend themselves on a path that is not, you know, one that we would want for a safe and healthy community. And so my approach is obviously being able to redirect resources to, to address the three core issues which I believe are constant in the community as it relates to crime, hopelessness, substance abuse, and mental health. And some people say, well, how is it that simple? Well, a reasonable person doesn't pick up a gun and shoot somebody. A reasonable person does not do that. And so that means you're dealing with someone who's not reasonable or may not be uh, functioning with a clear mind at that time. So that's where you talk about the undiagnosed trauma. Uh, people who have ever had had adverse childhood experiences and so their reaction may be an overreaction by most per people's standards and so if we've never really acknowledged that those are real factors and we've not provided the resources to help um, address those social norms that are abnormal how do you expect a different outcome and so that's where the mental health comes in because it's not always bipolar schizophrenic sometimes it's cognitive behavior therapy acknowledging that you know, you're feeling this way, but is your reaction really the best reaction for it? And some people say, well, that's kind of fundamental. You're right, it is, and we need to offer it in schools, but there are a lot of adults who didn't get it, and there's a whole generation that did not get it, and we're experiencing increased violence in our community because they lack the skills, right? But in addition to that, I believe also people who have something to lose make better choices. And so making sure we're creating economic opportunities for those same individuals to get out of those communities, get out of those situations. Uh, I was at the prosecutor's office when the NOVA initiative was started. I helped um, establish some of the community components of it and the engagement opportunities. But people in the community are very reluctant to get help from the prosecutor. Because usually when you're working with the prosecutor, either you're snitching, uh, you know, you've got some deal with the police, and these are the same people who may have just busted you up for something a few weeks ago, or a few months ago. And so do you really want help from them, and do you trust the help they're giving you? Even though it is a genuine offer of help, I think the messenger, it was kind of convoluted. So those aspects did not take hold like they should have, but those resources are still needed, and those opportunities should still be made available in our community. Uh, and as the next mayor, I'll continue to, to put forth uh, a collaboration of opportunities and resources to make that happen. What are some of the short-term steps do you think you would take as soon as you get into office on the issue of violence? Uh, well, that's my number one priority, and, and my approach is to be intentional and deliberate about addressing that as a long-term approach, engaging the community, having a conversation with the police department, because a lot of my colleagues will have a discussion, even community members will say, well, we need more police officers. But my answer is why? Why do we need more police officers? Well, because crime is bad. Well, you know, it costs us a million dollars to have 10 new officers, a million bucks. If we took that million dollars and invested it into one of the zip codes where they're responding to the most, I think we get a, a much better reduction in crime by making a million dollar investment in that community than putting 10 officers on the street because the 10 officers are going to be reactive. And the goal is for us to reduce the number of calls for service so you don't need as many officers. Um, and so we have to be very balanced in our approach to be able to do that because I'm also sympathetic to the officers that are responding from call to call and overwhelmed. I talked to uh, an officer's wife. I was out knocking doors out in the eastern part of my district and uh, on her doorstep in tears with her daughter on her hip because her husband is just so stressed out. He's out in a zone um, where he's one of sometimes four people on patrol and um, he's from call to call to call and he comes home and he's just overwhelmed and uh, it has a strain on their family and so for that I'm very sympathetic to officers and us doing enough to sufficiently staff patrol um, but we have to make sure that even as we're making those shifts in staffing we are reducing the calls and service and the reasons why people are being responded to I'll give an example another analogy would be if we have if we saw an increase in house fires in Kansas City Will we just only hire firemen? No, we will figure out why we're having so many house fires. We will invest in figuring out what the problem was to reduce the number of fires. For whatever reason, when it comes to crime, we have not taken that same approach. And that's the difference in the public health approach to dealing with violence in Kansas City. We have not taken the time to invest the money in what's causing the problem and invest in the solutions at that level. We want to hire more firemen. And that's not the best approach and long term because it's not sustainable. Our budget won't support it. Uh, and the community is being impacted in too much of a significant way. They want relief in terms of investment, uh, in terms of resources to address the social ills. Uh, and as the next mayor, my priority is to do that. 
And so aside from looking at KCPD staffing, what would be some of the very early on first couple months steps that you would take to start working on that vision? Uh, I would engage the um, community stakeholders that already operate in that space, the mental health service providers, um, groups that offer substance abuse treatment and resources, the courts, um, to better understand where they believe um, how we prioritize, where we address it. <clears throat> because at some point, I mean, starting out, you're going to be, tri you're going to have to triage. Um, because if you don't have all the money in place, if you don't have all the resources in place, you have to triage. And I believe those stakeholders have the information to help point me in the right direction to start. And that's number one, because it, it, the trends change. We're seeing more women that are uh, finding themselves in the court system right now. We know why. And we know when women find themselves in the court system, their children are impacted as well. And so we have to be prepared to deal with that as we deal with the issue. Because you can't just deal with the crime because there's always a family behind it. And uh, I think we've been short-sighted in how we've looked at that. Switching gears, it wouldn't be a can't read interview without me bringing up the airport. Yes. Um, so I'll sip on this. Yes, slow. please. Yeah, uh -huh. and you can absolutely <laughs> drink your smoothie um, as I've been drinking mine. So, you have been pretty outspoken on the airport recently. Mm -hmm. Kind of tell me so far what have been your concerns in watching this process unfold. You know, I'll be very honest. This has been a disturbing process from the very beginning. At the private meeting at the River Club when this whole idea was concocted to do a sole source bid for the largest infrastructure project in the history of the city. If we were in Chicago, that would, be con con it would very much be considered as a crooked deal uh, and that there was some backroom dealing that was going on. For whatever reason, we haven't characterized it as that here in Kansas City. Um, but the same people that were at that initial meeting have continued down the road uh, in quote unquote leading this initiative and we have left a lot on the table and a lot to be desired in this process as far as um, lack of transparency. Um, we've made a lot of promises that we were not able to deliver on uh, and, and that's why I ultimately voted no. Um, the, the process has been disturbing because uh, we told the voters that this project was going to be transformative that there was gonna be a huge boom to the local community uh, and we were gonna have this robust community benefit agreement and that it was gonna be opportunities for everybody. Um, but that's not reflected in the, the document that the council voted on last week, uh, which is why I voted no. Uh, we told the community members there was not gonna be any taxpayer dollars in this project and there's an ordinance before council right now to consider a $90 million bond issuance that will be repaid later. Uh, that's not what we promised the voters. And so when I say the process has been disturbing, it's well documented and it's been equally criticized by my colleagues uh, who ultimately decided they would go with the status quo. But as I was quoting the business journal, I wasn't willing to rubber stamp a deal that I didn't have confidence in. We made commitments and we need to deliver on them. And we, have, we had the opportunity to get there, um, but for the mayor, the manager, and Jolie being so in a hurry to make this happen. And so uh, I'm disappointed. Uh, in a lot of ways because uh, I believe we missed a lot of opportunities here. Uh, so this wasn't mission accomplished. This was a hurried, rushed effort. Um, and despite the political grandstanding, uh, it is my intention to make sure that we do deliver on uh, making sure that the local community benefits from it and that the taxpayers are not uh, going to be stuck holding the bill on any parts of this. So since it's not written in the agreement, some of these other benefits mm -hmm. that Edgemore and the city had talked about, are you going to be the person trying to hold them accountable for delivering on these, or how do you do well, that? Well, and I've, I've done that uh, as a council person. We've had good conversations, and they're saying, well, just trust me. Uh, and I'm not saying I don't trust them. Uh, I just have gone through this same situation with Cordish, where they made a commitment they were going to provide affordable housing and their units, and they're about to build the third, third building, and they've yet to deliver on it. And so when you, come, when you look at large scale deals like this, um, the devil's in the details, it's always. And it was suggestive language said that we will, it was kind of aspirational. We would like to provide affordable housing and then we've given them millions of dollars and they've yet to do it. And so where was the community benefit in that scenario? I have concerns we're gonna see some of the same things come to play with this deal as well. Um, and, that, and that shouldn't come to any surprise to anybody who understands how contracts are negotiated. If it's not in the document, there's no obligation for it to happen. And this administration is going to turn over. Uh, the next mayor is going to come in. Uh, and as the next mayor, uh, we're going to have some amendments to the, these agreements. It's just part of how these scale uh, projects go. Uh, and I will be committed to making sure 
that we are able to uh, memorialize a lot of these verbal agreements that these gentlemen's handshakes that have happened behind closed doors. From planes to trains, I want to talk about the streetcar a little bit. Yes. What do you think about the extensions that are kind of being planned for right now, both to the riverfront and also down Main Street? You know, I think anything we talk about in transit should be discussed in a regional perspective. Um, the streetcar has, is here. We need to figure out how to maximize it. Um, but what's more important in Kansas City is how do we deal with regional transit, getting people to work from their doorstep and making sure we have connectivity where economic centers are, uh, where affordable housing is. And so I think anything around the streetcar ext extension needs to be considered in the aggregate of that because any dollars we expend towards expansion are going to um, may put us in a situation where we're not able to effectively do some of the other practical things when it comes to regional transit. So I would like to have all these things in uh, and coordinated conversations uh, will be my preference. Do you feel like right now the streetcar is benefiting people who live east of Truce? Do you think that it's helping them, anyone like that, get to work? I'll tell you, my, uh, my nieces and nephews, I had them over the summer, uh, and uh, I, I took them on the streetcar for the first time uh, this summer, and uh, they didn't know it existed, didn't know anything about it, uh, and unless you have a reason to go ride it, you know, it serves no purpose to them, right? I mean, they're not necessarily going to Union Station, uh, and, and they don't have any business downtown. So, you know, the money that we've spent on that didn't necessarily benefit them directly. Um, but, you know, I think it was a cool experience and they enjoyed it. Um, but we need to figure out how to make, make, it, how to make it work for, uh, for us in, in a broader sense. You mentioned the regional cooperation. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you about, another thing, how do you see yourself working with other leaders in the region. You know, Kansas City, Missouri is not an island. We are connected to all of these communities. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's important to work alongside them? Oh, absolutely. And I've demonstrated my ability and willingness to do that. I've had good conversations with um, some of the mayors in the region, a number of different opportunities as we talk about crime and violence and housing. Um, there are a number of different conveners of, of coalitions in the region. Um, but the key is making sure that Kansas City is leading on issues and that we're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars and making sure that it's a safe city for our residents and there's affordable housing that exists here. I think those have to be at the forefront of what we're doing. Um, and if we do those things well, people will continue to look to us and respect us as a leading um, city. I mean, we're the largest city in the 500 mile radius. Uh, we've got to lead and we need to lead with dignity. We need to um, lead with a level of confidence uh, that the voters can trust and so with the surrounding leaders as well. Pivoting to education, mm -hmm. what do you think of the mayor's pre-K plan? You know, um, I think that using the 3.8 cent sales tax for anything other than economic development priorities of the city, which would be housing, transportation, infrastructure, uh, is problematic. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, he, he identified a problem that needed a solution. Uh, and then he missed, he, and then he said, okay, well, here's some money over here. I'll try to use that to solve it. Well, the money for his problem lies in the school district's authority under the mill levy. And I support the school districts asking for mill levy increases to provide education options. I support the council's priority of housing, infrastructure, and um, transportation for our economic development sales tax. So you think that you'll be voting no on that issue? Um, I do not support using the 3 cent sales tax for pre-K. Uh, I would support pre-K using a meal levy increase led by the school districts. i to make sure I'm not missing things. Okay. This is a question I've been asking everyone. This is a crowded field, 11 people. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes you stand out? Well, it's the obvious. I'm the only woman of color in the race. Uh, that's one thing. I just naturally stand out. But aside from that, uh, I'm the only I'm the only candidate that's running for mayor that has been a consistent uh, watchdog of taxpayer dollars when it has come to these corporate giveaways and incentives. I'm the only council person um, that's running that has consistently been an advocate for neighborhoods and. Um, making sure that we are putting public safety as a priority. I'm the only council person and the only person that's running this race that has been committed and steadfast in transparency, conducting um, uh, this process in a manner of integrity and not, and not um, 
really succumbing to corporate interests in this process. My message is consistent. Uh, I've been very diligent in my approach uh, and very resilient in making sure that my neighborhood leaders, um, the kids that I see every day, um, are going to have a strong advocate in City Hall that's going to look out for their interests and making sure that we're growing Kansas City together across the board. Uh, I've demonstrated my ability to stand up against special interests, stand up to political pressure, and stand up to cronyism, essentially, and say we're going to do what's right because it's right, the right thing to do, and I believe the voters respect that. How do you envision yourself being a different mayor than Mayor Sly James? Well, we have, we have different uh, priorities. We have different personalities. Uh, I believe that uh, I will incorporate the best approaches that he's already put in place and adopt those in my administration, and I will build upon the other opportunities of making sure that livability, safety, economic opportunities, uh, and housing are a priority in my administration. Uh, but more importantly than that, making sure that uh, I leave a legacy that people can say, I saw her and I was inspired. I saw her and I believed that I could do anything that was possible. I saw her and I knew that what she said she meant it and she was going to deliver on her commitments. That's the legacy I want to leave. Was there a person who instilled that legacy in you? Because you obviously are a hard worker. You worked through high school and went to college, worked, you know, then did law school. Was there someone who inspired you to do all that? My mom. My mom was a teen parent. She had her first child at 14 years old. And myself and my two older brothers, uh, she even raised my cousin who was murdered in October. Um, and she just worked really hard. There were no excuses. Um, it doesn't matter your circumstances. There are so many opportunities that are available to you and you need to position yourself to take advantage of them. My goal, my priority is to make sure that those same opportunities that existed when I was 16 working full time exist for a 16 year old today. That exist for a 14 year old teen mom that wants something better for herself than to be a statistic that my mom had available to her. That's my commitment to Kansas City. What does your mom think about you running? She's so proud. She's very proud. She's very, very proud. But, you know, the sad thing about that is that my mom's not going to be able to vote in this election for me because my mom lives in Grandview because as a senior, she was looking for affordable senior housing and she couldn't find it in Kansas City. And so my mom lives outside the city limits now because she could not find affordable senior housing. Yeah. And so that's heartbreaking, but that goes to my commitment of why we have to do better uh, and creating opportunities for those that want to age in place in Kansas City uh, and making sure things are affordable. You mentioned your cousin. I mean, the issue of violence has become a very, very personal one for you. Mm -hmm. How did that experience and what you guys went through as a family change the way you look at things? You know, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still walking through that. Right, that happened in, on October 15th, um, and and that was, you know, uh, we were kind of right in finding a rhythm in this process, and it took the wind out of me for a little bit. Right, uh, I'm, I remember that was. Um, that fundraising quarter, I, I didn't really, you know, have much activity because I just, I just had the wind knocked out of me, literally. Um, but I, I will tell you, as a family, we were so resilient, uh, and there's so much, um, so much love between us that has has helped me move forward. And they have not allowed me to wallow uh, in what didn't happen. It's inspired me to press forward despite circumstances because I know that I am the best candidate to address these issues for our community and uh, I look forward to the, toward the opportunity to do that.